Thank you so much, Dale. It is a true pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, as Dale said, I grew up in North Dakota, so I feel like I'm back home. And it is an honor to be with you on the, for the 50th anniversary of South Dakota Right to Life. For 50 years, you have been working to protect unborn children and their mothers, educating fellow South Dakotans about the issue of humanity and passing legislation and electing the candidates who are going to vote for that legislation. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. Now, it's kind of unusual to celebrate 50 years because in that time, this country has lost 62 million babies. So it's kind of bittersweet. But we do proclaim to South Dakota and to the country that even after 50 years, this organization is going strong and we are not giving up. We've had some exciting things happen lately, as uh, just was mentioned within the last few minutes, uh, the, the Dobbs case in the Supreme Court coming up on December 1st. It's Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. That, of course, is the only abortion facility in the state of Mississippi. Their state law going before the Supreme Court would protect unborn children after 15 weeks pregnancy. The Supreme Court agreed to hear the case, but they said the issue before them would be whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. Well, since abortion isn't in the Constitution, of course it would be um, unconstitutional. The answer is no. Um, but I hope what is clear to us uh, is also clear to the members of the court. As Senator Thune mentioned, we've got some great new justices on the court, so we are very hopeful that they will look at the humanity of the unborn child when making those decisions. The age of viability for an unborn child is generally considered to be about 24 weeks, although some babies have survived at 22 or even 21 weeks. And that could go younger, we don't know, as technology advances. So we need to be protecting those babies and then keep fighting to save the rest. And then we have Texas, which has stopped most abortions in their state. The new law requires the abortionist to determine the age of the unborn child, whether a heartbeat can be detected, and then to record in the, the record that information as well as what tests were conducted to get that information. And if the heartbeat has begun, the abortionist cannot perform the abortion. But if a private individual has evidence that the abortion did take place, he or she can file a lawsuit against the abortionist or anyone who aided in the commission of that procedure. Now, abortion providers tried to sue the state to prevent the law from going into effect on uh, September 1st, but the state doesn't have authority to enforce the law. There really is no one to sue for the courts. You know, the, 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 uh, they can't, there's nobody to enjoin or prevent from enforcing the law unless they're gonna file a, some kind of lawsuit and list absolutely every person that lives in Texas just to cover their bases to make sure that none of them can file a suit. Although it doesn't have to be a Texan. It can be anybody that has that information. Now, of course, the Biden administration has stepped in with the Department of Justice acting as the personal corporate law firm for the abortion industry. And they, there was a hearing today before a federal court judge as to whether or not the state law is interfering with the 14th Amendment rights of a woman to uh, get an abortion. And we don't know what will happen. It's likely that some court will find a way to strike that law. But in the meantime, we have had at least a month, and I'm amazed it has lasted that long, um, in which the babies have been protected. And quite frankly, the abortion industry is perplexed, discombobulated, confused. You know, They don't know how to handle this because they've never been faced with something like this. But we watch and we pray, and we continue our efforts in all other areas. Because of your efforts and because of those around, uh, going on around our country among pro-lifers, our nation is still not comfortable talking about abortion. It's not a topic that you're going to hear around the dinner table. Well, Susie, what did you do today? Well, I went to Planned Parenthood and got an abortion. Or I took my friend to the abortion facility to get an abortion. That's not the common, common topic around the dinner table. Abortion is still not viewed as just another routine medical procedure. 
any woman who is considering an abortion will have and know a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a coworker who would encourage her not to do it. So because it's still after 50 years, something that's kind of hidden under the table, the abortion industry decided they wanted to try something. So they started this Shout Your Abortion campaign, trying to get women who have had abortions to come out and talk about it and tell everybody how wonderful their lives are because they killed their child. Well, some activists have come forward, and we've seen award shows where an actress will stand up and say, I could do this because I had an abortion. But there isn't exactly a groundswell of support and a groundswell of women coming forward to say, I had an abortion. Why is that? Why is there still that discomfort about abortion? I truly believe it's because deep down, everyone knows we're talking about the life of an innocent human being. Now, over the years, there were political leaders who supported abortion, but they would say they were personally opposed, which was code for, but don't worry, I'm not going to do anything about it. And then we got to President Bill Clinton, who said abortion should be safe, legal, and rare, although he did everything he could to promote it in this country and, in, and overseas. But that raised the question. If there is nothing wrong with abortion, and it can be, or should be safe and legal, why should it be rare? What's wrong with it? We don't say appendicitis should be safe, legal, and rare. Well, if you've got a problem, take the appendix out. But we do say that abortion should be rare, or at least we used to. So that reluctance to fully embrace abortion was hurting the cause. So groups like Planned Parenthood and NARAL had to challenge the idea that abortion is bad. They decided that if you don't like abortion, you are anti-woman, and somehow this farcical war on women attack began. There is a war on women in this country, but it is being waged by those in the abortion industry who don't care about the babies involved, and neither do they care about the lives of the mothers involved. Abortion is the least regulated invasive procedure in the country. Only 28 states require that women be fully informed about the abortion procedure, its potential medical risks, and available alternatives. Something that is required for every other surgical procedure performed in this country. 29 states have informed consent laws that require or at least make available an ultrasound as part of the abortion process. Now, abortion advocates do not want the woman to see an ultrasound of her unborn child. They want to rush her through the abortion uh, procedure, get her in and out as fast as she can before she changes her mind. Because if she gets that ultrasound, if she sees her baby, if she hears that baby's heartbeat, there's a very good chance she is not going to go through with the abortion. How is that pro-woman? Shouldn't she have all the facts and all the information before making that life or death decision? Now, speaking of informed consent, why do abortion advocates refuse to even acknowledge the possibility of a link between abortion and increasing the risk of breast cancer in later years? Out of 108 worldwide studies published on abortion and breast cancer, 73% found an increased risk between induced abortion and the later development of breast cancer. Now think, if you watch TV, and I realize some of you probably do Hulu and Netflix and there's no commercials, but if you do watch TV, think of all the commercials that are there for all the prescription drugs that are available. Talk to your doctor if, and you know, all these things, do you have this problem? Well, this drug is gonna solve it. But every single commercial spends almost half the time telling people what could be wrong, what could go wrong. If this occurs, talk, talk to your doctor. You know, talk to your doctor, do not take if. They're all doing this disclaimer because it's a you know, legal problem if someone would decide to, to sue them or go after them. But there is absolutely no interest and a lot of um, talk of junk science about the breast cancer claim with abortion. So, you know, Again, they're, they're not interested in helping women. They want to stop breast cancer. They're raising a lot of money, but they won't tell women that there might actually be a link. Chemical abortion is another, it's a growing problem in this country. 
Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of abortions in America. In its latest report, 2019-2020, they claimed 354,871 abortions, 41% of all abortions in the United States. That's 972 every day. If they were doing abortions 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, that would be 40.5 babies every hour. But Planned Parenthood is not content to just have women walk through their doors to get the abortion. Some Planned Parenthood facilities are doing so-called webcam or telemed abortions. Rather than meeting the abortionist in person, a pregnant woman sits in a Planned Parenthood office in one city, the abortionist is in another uh, office in another city, con and they converse over the computer, you know, Zoom call, Skype, whatever it might be. The abortionist pushes a button on his computer that opens a drawer in the room where she is seated. Inside that drawer is a chemical cocktail that will kill her unborn child. The abortionist will tell her to take the first set of pills, which is mifepristone, or we used to say RU486, which kills the developing baby by starving her of the nutritional progesterone in the uterus. And then he is going to tell her that there's a second set of pills, go home and in a couple of days take those pills. Those are the ones that will induce cramping and expel the dead baby. Now, chemical abortions are dangerous and painful. 24 women who used excuse me, mifepristone are known to have died in the United States since 2000, and thousands of women have suffered serious complications, including blood loss requiring transfusions and severe systemic infections. Prescribing a chemical cocktail to a woman who is perhaps hundreds of miles away and not being there to help if there are complications is certainly not pro-woman. But it gets even worse. Because of the pandemic, the FDA is allowing pills to be mailed to women in their homes for a dangerous do-it-at-home, do-it-yourself abortion. Advocates want that action to be made permanent. Now, 24 states, including South Dakota, congratulations, have laws in effect requiring the abortionist to be physically present in the same room as the woman when administering that chemical abortion so she can't just get it from him over the internet and have the pills mailed to her at home. Now, I'm going to get into all of that tomorrow morning, so if you want to hear more, please come back. Now, recognizing that most teenage girls are not able to handle a big decision by themselves, you know, a 15-year-old girl doesn't know if she should be getting an abortion or not. Um, at the time, she might think it's the best thing because she's scared and she doesn't know what she's going to do. Um, but 30 states have laws that do require parents to be notified or give their consent before that minor girl gets an abortion, which means 20 states don't have that kind of protection for the girl or the parents. But abortion advocates have fought every single one of those laws when they were going through the legislature, and they would still love to overturn them. They tried to do it in Illinois just earlier this year. When a 15-year-old girl is lying on her bed at night crying because of that baby that she killed, the abortionists are not going to be there holding her hands. It's going to be mom and dad trying to comfort her, trying to figure out what is going on. But if you think that mom and dad should be involved in, in that decision and hopefully maybe talk her out of it or tell her she's not going to do it, you are waging a war on women. Now, unborn babies by at least 20 weeks can feel pain. So far, 15 states, including South Dakota, prohibit abortions on babies who can feel pain. But if you think those babies should be protected, you are anti-woman because you are not letting her get that abortion. 13 states passed laws to protect unborn babies from being killed by the gruesome dismemberment abortion method. Now, unfortunately, because of the courts, only four are currently in effect. But known in the abortion industry as a D&E, or dilation and evacuation, this is the most common procedure performed on about 95% of all abortions after the first trimester. But if you think that we should be protecting those babies from having their arms and their legs and their head torn off from the torso in that abortion procedure so that they don't bleed to death, uh, if you oppose that, again, that would make you anti-woman. Now, you remember the case of Kermit Gosnell up in Philadelphia back in 2013. He was convicted on three counts of murder for delivering babies, snipping them in the back of the neck, and severing the spinal cord thereby killing them. Now, conditions at his facility were deplorable. 
blood on the floor, blood on the blankets, stench of urine in the air, a flea-infested cat was wandering the facility. Women were given those blood-stained blankets, surgical procedure rooms, and instruments were used woman after woman without being cleaned in between each, uh, each procedure. Non-sterilized equipment was used and reused. Now, he asked the National Abortion Federation if he could become a member. They say that they are an association of abortion providers. They didn't, they didn't accept him. I mean, they actually sent someone into his clinic to do a little investigation or inspection. And whoever did that inspection came back and reported it was so bad it would not be beneficial to the National Abortion Federation to let him become a member. Planned Parenthood in the Philadelphia area knew about the terrible conditions at his place because women who had been there for an abortion would then come to their place for a later abortion. They didn't want to go back. But Planned Parenthood, the National Abortion Federation, did nothing about it. They didn't report him to the AMA or the State Health Board in Pennsylvania. They didn't report him to um, any authority that might have been able to do something, if nothing else, tell him to clean up his act. It was more important to them that he be able to continue that procedure. Getting the abortions was more important than how safe it was for the women going into that place. Now, pro-abortion organizations like to say that they are helping women, but in reality, they are looking to profit off of women because abortion is a money-making business. Now, another way that I believe they truly are anti-woman uh, anti we all know people that work or we work ourselves, many of you do, at pregnancy resource centers. They are absolutely amazing, providing free care and support to women going through a difficult pregnancy. We've had some states like California, Illinois, Hawaii, uh, I think Washington was doing it, tried to tell the pregnancy centers in those states that they had to inform the women where they could get an abortion and at least in California, they had to tell them that the state would pay for it. Well, thank goodness the Supreme Court, you know, had some common sense and the First Amendment ru uh, ruled and they, the law was, was struck. But they're trying to even shut down our pregnancy centers, giving them bad reviews on Yelp and whatever else, just trying to make them look so bad that no woman would want to go there. And yet they are the most loving, caring place that any pregnant woman with some decisions and some problems would be able to go. But they don't want women to have that option. She's only supposed to go to that abortion facility. So why does the abortion industry fight any and all efforts to protect babies and mothers in any way, even those that might seem reasonable or might have a large, you know, overwhelming support in the country? Because if there is one crack in that position, if the unborn child is protected at any time for any reason, their position falls apart. Like the argument for safe, legal, and rare, if it's okay or necessary to protect an unborn child at any age, at any time, even late in pregnancy, then there is something wrong with abortion. And for them, the unborn child must be sacrificed at any and all cost. That living unborn baby must be destroyed. But since society's response to a woman with a problem pregnancy is to kill the child, we can tell that that is affecting our society as a whole. It is no surprise that our response to someone with an illness or a disability or to someone who is different is to kill the problem, kill the person. Studies show that between 60 and 90% of unborn babies diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. Iceland likes to brag that they have eradicated Down syndrome. Well, instead, they have eradicated people with Down syndrome. There state, state laws, some states have been able to pass a law uh, against you know, discrimination. You can't uh, get an abortion or perform an abortion because the child has a disability. Uh, many of them specifically mention Down syndrome. And the courts are having a real trouble, a real problem with that. Several states have passed those kinds of laws, but only four of them, I believe, are in effect. And South Dakota is one of them, uh, protecting babies with Down syndrome. But the courts will say absolutely, you know, if that's, why, if that's why the mother wants the abortion, then let her. More and more, we hear of parents who have had to fight with doctors and hospitals to get treatment for a child with genetic disorders. I met one mother in Missouri who overheard a doctor say that he was going to order 
tests for her son. And if it proved that the child had an abnormality, which he did, it was trisomy 18, the doctor was not going to do the kind of treatment he would if the child came out as have, you know, being normal in whatever that would mean. But the doctor put a do not resuscitate order on her baby's um, chart and didn't tell them. And, and the baby did die. So she's been fighting in state legislatures to make that change. The parents have to be notified or give permission before a do not resuscitate order is placed on their child's chart. Food and water or nutrition and hydration are defined as medical treatment and routinely withheld from el the elderly in hospitals and nursing homes. Oregon has enacted a law openly recognizing the practice and allowing healthcare personnel to withhold food and water from persons with Alzheimer's and dementia. In other words, starve them to death. We have insurance companies and state health programs offering to pay for assisted suicide while, offer, while refusing cancer treatments. In 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada struck their law against assisted suicide. It first started out as allowing terminally ill patients the right to decide when and how they die. But that quickly changed. Doctors are being told to kill their patients upon request or find a different occupation. Hospice associations are being told to provide assisted suicide or lose their government funding. Switzerland has a growing tourism industry based on suicide clinics. And there you don't have to be a doctor to help someone kill themselves. The Netherlands and, the Belgium, and Belgium were first to allow assisted suicide, but the numbers are growing of people being put to death without their consent. They also euthanize minors with or without parental consent and newborn babies. Uh, the peddlers of death are pushing hard to legalize the practice here in this country. So far, nine states and the District of Columbia have statutes allowing assisted suicide, but fortunately, most states are still rejecting that idea. California passed their bill in 2015, and the, the sponsors assured everyone, we have so many safeguards in this bill. You're going to have to go to a doctor and get a mental evaluation, and then if you, you know, he does sign off on this assisted suicide procedure, then, you know, He'll give you a prescription for the pills, but then you have to wait so many days after you fill the prescription before you finally take it. And don't worry, this is going to be very safe only and only for those who really need it and really want it. This year, they are back in the state, in the state legislature, the same sponsors, with an effort to remove every single safeguard that they were you know, using at that time. And it will, it's California. It will probably pass. Human beings are better than dogs or trees or a lump of coal. We are created in the image of God. And we need to be caring about other human life. We have the, I believe, the right to be respected for who we are because of who we are. And that extends to every single human being created. All human life from conception to natural death must be protected. And I know that a lot of what I've just told you is kind of depressing. <laughs> so I want to tell you why, I'm going to flip it, why I think we truly are making a difference and we are winning. The pro-life movement is stronger than it has ever been. I've been in this movement since the late 1970s. And there is more activity, more involvement, more creativity, more energized people than there have ever been. There's an educational value in what we do. We are, of course, educating our neighbors, our communities, the humanity of the unborn child, the, um, the reason we need to be protecting and taking care of senior citizens and those with disabilities. But we're also educating when we do that. Partial birth abortion. Did you know that babies have a brain and they're being stabbed in the back of the head and the brain is being sucked out and that's how they're dying? Did you know that babies 20 weeks after conception can feel pain? Did you know that babies after six weeks have a heartbeat that you can hear? I mean, our legislation saves lives, but it's also a great educational tool. And that's happening all over the country. Time and technological developments are on our side. 
And I truly believe that's going to make a huge difference in, in abortion's downfall. It's been 30 years. Harrison Hickman, a one-time pollster for NARAL, stated, nothing has been as damaging to our cause as the advances in technology which have allowed pictures of the developing fetus because people now talk about the fetus in much different terms than they did. They talk about it as a human being, which is not something that I have an easy answer on how to cure. Now, in the 30 years since he said that, ultrasound technology has gone from grainy, gray, fuzzy pictures to 3D and 4D. You can see the baby's face. You can tell, you know, is that mom's smile? Is that dad's nose? A baby's first picture is no longer being wrapped in a cute little pink or blue fuzzy blanket, you know, wrapped in mom's arms. The first picture is that ultrasound. We are finding out more about the development of these little ones. We know that after birth, babies respond to voices and music that they heard before birth. We know that preborn babies, as I mentioned, before 20 weeks can feel pain. A study published in the journal Developmental Science looked at how the brains of babies respond when different parts of the body are tapped. We now know that the touch is the first sensory system to develop in the baby's brain before birth. We also see babies born prematurely surviving earlier into the pregnancy. Our society is looking at this new life, I think, in a different manner because it's not just waiting until the baby comes out and we can see and hold the baby. There's a growing network of medical personnel around the country getting, getting involved in the abortion pill reversal process. If a woman takes that first pill that's going to kill her unborn child, but has not yet taken the second pill, which will cause the cramps and expel that dead baby, she can get a heavy dose progesterone treatment and possibly reverse that, that abortion process maybe saving her baby. Now, nine states have amended their informed consent laws to require that a woman who gets an abor the chemical abortion be told that if she changes her mind after taking those first set of pills, that she might still be able to save her baby. We can urge more doctors to become part of that network. Why else do I think we can see the beginning of the end? The American public is becoming more and more pro-life and moving toward protection for unborn children. Now, if you look at the polls, the headlines are going to be very misleading. Look at the information in, inside the poll. Gallup came out with a poll, and their head, big headline was, majority in U.S. still want abortion legal, comma, with limits. Now, if someone said that abortion should be legal in only a few circumstances, that answer was included in the headline of people wanting abortion to remain legal. If you look at their latest poll taken in June, or excuse me, at least released in June, 52% want abortion legal only in a few circumstances or illegal in all circumstances. 45% said abortion should be legal in all or most circumstances. But of that 45, only 32% support the position of the abortion movement and the Democrat Party, allowing abortion for any reason. If they were asked about any reason, would you allow abortion for any reason through all nine months of pregnancy, I have no doubt that number would be even lower. Polls do show that a majority of Americans do not want the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, that may be accurate, but only because people don't know what Roe v. Wade and its companion case, Doe v. Bolton, did. If they support any limit on abortion, then they don't support Roe v. Wade. They just don't know it, and that's going to be up to us to tell them what those cases are doing and have done. The end to abortion will be aided by successful elections. As Senator Thune mentioned, having a pro-life president for four years who is able to appoint pro-Constitution judges to the federal bench federal district courts, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court, that's already having an impact on pro-life laws. We are seeing more and more courts around the country upholding laws or uh, at least not refusing to, to strike them. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California used to be horrible. Now it's kind of like, wow, that came out of the Ninth. You know, that's good. Um, but we need to keep working. Uh, the issue of the life resonates with voters. In polls that ask voters who they voted for and why, 
The pro-life candidate always has the advantage, including among women. So if you look at the people who I am so invested in this issue that I am going to vote for candidates based on that issue, the pro-life candidate always wins because our people want to change the law and they are voting for candidates who will do that. No, we don't always win, unfortunately. We now have a president who supports abortion for all nine months of pregnancy for any reason, and he wants our tax dollars to pay for them, both here and in other countries. But we were able to at least hold the line in the Senate. Uh, we do have 50 votes when it comes to, at least 50 when it comes to most of the measures. Um, and Senator Manchin is giving us 51, so that is wonderful. We need to add more senators next year, and we need to add more House members, definitely, because we can. I think we can take back the House of Representatives next year. No more Speaker Pelosi. That would be wonderful. There are two things I want to quickly mention. Um, the House passed this week the Women's Health Protection Act. That is a bill that will overrule every pro-life law that South Dakota has passed. It will overrule every pro-life law that in all 50 states, whether it is parental involvement, consent or notification before their minor daughter can get an abortion, uh, tax funding limits on abortion, um, informed consent provisions, telling a woman different information about the baby and alternatives that are available. Um, everything that we have passed in the past 50 years would be gone. On the federal level, conscience protection laws, they want doctors and nurses, to be, medical personnel, to be forced to uh, perform abortions. Uh, that bill did pass the House of Representatives this week. Every Republican voted no. Every Democrat but one voted yes. They had one Democrat from Texas who said, this is going too far, I can't support it. We're gonna be able to hold it in the Senate, but it's, it's too close, we really do need to do. And I know you're the wrong crowd to be even telling this. I mean, you've got Senator Thune, Senator Rounds, Congressman Dust, uh, Dusty Johnson, um, but bring them back. We need those kind of leaders in Washington. The Hyde Amendment is another serious problem. Congress is dealing with the annual budget. Congress is supposed to pass a budget by September 30th, which was yesterday. They didn't get it put together. They can't agree between the two houses what it should be, so they passed a continuing resolution to keep the government going until December 3rd. But they, the Democrats in the House removed the Hyde Amendment, which means our tax dollars would be paying for abortion in Medicaid and several other programs that are in the federal budget. We have to make sure that the Hyde Amendment is not removed from the budget. And again, your, your senators and your representative are going to be solid. But if you've got family members and friends in other country, uh, states, and I know you do, let them know, make sure they know that the Hyde Amendment is, could be in danger. Now the solution, if they, you know, just put the Hyde Amendment back in. They pass a budget, put the Hyde Amendment in so that none of our tax dollars can be used to pay for abortions in any federal program. If they can't, you know, somehow can't, can't manage that, then they need to just either keep continuing these continuing resolutions, and basically what that means is we're gonna keep funding the government at the same levels as last year's budget. It's not gonna increase, but it's gonna be at least you know, last year's budget. Last year's budget had the Hyde Amendment. So what they're doing now until December 3rd, again, our tax dollars are still not paying for abortion. But my message very strongly to members of Congress is if the Hyde Amendment is not in the budget, do not pass the budget. Shut down the government or keep doing the continuing resolution. Do not remove the Hyde Amendment because I don't know if we could get it back. You know, hopefully we can, but I don't want to take that chance and say, well, it's only going to be for nine months. December till next September. Well, no, we don't know what's going to happen in the election. We're going to work very hard, but Hyde Amendment, if it is not in the budget, the budget cannot pass. That's a message you need to pass on. Now, polling also frequently shows that the younger age groups in their 20s and 30s are also becoming strongly pro-life. And if you've been to the marches, especially the rally in Washington in January, it's 90% high school and college students. 
I mean, the young people are more and more pro-life. And I think a lot of that has to do with their first baby picture. They saw themselves in the, in the ultrasound. How can they look at that baby, or that picture of themselves and say that baby doesn't count? I really think the technology is helping, um, uh, helping us with that younger group. The number of abortions is in decline. Our country had an all-time high of 1.6 million abortions in 1990. That is now down almost half, but 860,000 per year. The abortion rate, which is the number of abortions per women of reproductive age, and the abortion ratio, the number of abortions for every 1,000 live births, are both down to their lowest levels since 1973. States, <laughs> states are passing more and more pro-life legislation. Guttmacher Institute, which used to work, uh, be affiliated with Planned Parenthood, and they are still strongly pro-abortion, said that more pro-life laws passed this year than in any year since 1973. I think it's maybe a little strange, but a sign of our success was when a handful of states last year changed their laws to allow unlimited abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. New York, Vermont, Illinois, Rhode Island, those states really were afraid that Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned and they were going to use their opportunity to change their state law even if Roe was overturned. And tomorrow there are going to be hundreds of marches all over the country of women who are concerned that, or not, maybe it's not just women, but it will be people concerned that they are going to lose their right to kill unborn children. Now, I think that's a success. They really are afraid of that happening. Now, as pro-lifers, how do we respond? I sum it up as who we are and what we do in one word, love. This is the movement of love. I'm gonna read part, something you all know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I think that sums up a lot of what the pro-life movement is. We usually hear, hear those words at weddings, but it means for the pro-life movement, it means that we seek to help and protect others simply because those others exist. We work to save people we will never meet, whether those are unborn babies saved from abortion, elderly and disabled persons saved from euthanasia. They may never know that something that we did made it possible for them to live. I think that is the greatest expression of love. And our love is endless because we will never give up. Now, there is no question that evil has been unleashed in this world. There is a bloodthirst for these babies, and their mothers are collateral damage. We're ready. I believe we are ready to face that battle. But we need every pro-lifer active and involved. The movement is full of pro-life heroes. Some are well-known. Most are not. Most are doing what they can, where they are, with what they have. And that's what we need more of. Every pro-lifer is invaluable. Every pro-lifer is making a difference. And now is the time that you are needed most. At the 2008 National Right to Life Convention, we heard from Father Richard John Newhouse shortly before his death. And I'm going to end with a quote from him. We shall not weary, we shall not rest, until every unborn child is protected in law and welcomed in life. We shall not worry, we sh weary, we shall not rest, until all the elderly who have run life's course are protected against despair and abandonment, protected by the rule of law and the bonds of love. We shall not weary, we shall not rest, until every young woman is given the help she needs to recognize the problem of pregnancy as the gift of life. We shall not weary, we shall not rest, as we stand guard at the entrance gates and the exit gates of life, and at every step along the way of life, bearing witness in word and deed to the dignity of the human person, of every human person. The Right to Life movement loves not in word or talk, not just in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. May God bless you.
as you continue this work of love. Thank you.